It is 10 o'clock. I'm going to call the meeting to order if you would rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. So we have some really special guests today. Um, I saw one of them jumping on his handler earlier. Um, but Denise, do you want to come forward and sure. do the presentation? We're going to um, mess up the agenda just to hear everybody. Good morning, everyone. Um, we do have uh, some special guests here today. Recently, there was um, some community members in Rutledge that decided to do a fundraiser for a payment event. And if I could, Everybody, not just the community, but like we have the Lions Club from Surgeon, we have American Legion, um, so we have Joyce Wally, there's there's Kitty, and Honey, and Steve. And of course, um, we have Orchard in his K9 chaos. Do you want me to take chaos for you while you're up there? What was that? Do you want me to take chaos for you while you're yeah, up there? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so these guys have spent months and months um, doing wonderful things, selling cookies. Um, selling merchandise and just doing their all best to raise money for a Canadian unit. Um, in all, there was over 22,000. Wow. Wow. And that includes from the Lions, from the American Legion, and everything that these guys have done. So, Tiger was months. It, it's, it's so much appreciated, you guys. You don't know how much we appreciate you. So, thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah. Just a little picture, right? Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> 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 um, yeah. Chaos doesn't know what to think, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, me first. Chaos, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Sure. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you guys. You're welcome. You're a fun, fun day. Thank you. You guys do an amazing job your Pine County Sheriff's Department does for this community. I'm proud of those dogs too. I'm pretty proud of them. Gosh dang it. Yep. We yeah. need to have more fundraisers like this. Thank you. Yeah, very well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's welcome. It's very appreciated. We think they're pretty special too. The yeah. officers and the dogs. No. <laughs> it's community pride. So you don't have much if you don't have your community, and that town was full. The Will River Fire Department could not get through. Wow. Yeah. They want to be there next year. Right. <laughs> that's enough of that. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, thank you so thank much. You thank you. Guys. Yeah, thank you. When did you do that? It was September. Uh, it was September 12th, wasn't it? 14th. 14th. Day of the fun. Yeah. Yeah. First annual. They are pretty for next year. It is a very worthy cause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, getting back onto our agenda, is there anybody that would like to speak for public forum? Come on up. I know. Thank you. Um, so this is two paths. Um, 
So I'm going to train that nomad has to have to know what as far as uh, zoning and land use. So this is coming from this is the argument, I believe, is what the zoning could use for its is cultivation, industrial, commercial production, uh, and any outdoor specific agriculture. Uh, I believe that's exactly what our zoning and the community are at, and it's what we need to protect the community. As far as cultivations, they need to be in the industrial zone area, and this is what they're recommending. So we need to follow what the rules are recommending. Um, I also have a note about uh, marijuana insurance companies, how it is addictive, and that it is considered to be good. I also have it from our federal government, from federal employees, how even if you live in a state, that this is not considered acceptable, you must stay drug free, even if you're a federal employee. Also, have to see certain seizures of how the federal government does see property. This is still not a federal approved product. Um, we had a meeting um, with, uh, I believe, with some people that are big, these grow houses. They do not have any um, bias towards growth. So, brought up at the last meeting on the first was the fact that you cannot grow on city water, and that this is a problem. And I think that is totally incorrect. It is technically better because it's more controlled already coming out of the ground. So any wells that you get, you're going to have bacteria, you're going to have um, minerals, and then when it's already on the city water, these are already controlled. Yes, there is chlorine in those. We've already called our, our city to find out everything, but it's very easy to what they call dechlor. And it's very, very inexpensive, and it, it's, it's very easy to do. Um, and that anything in the city area already has utilities, it has to store, but this is the best place to put this, tax base, security reasons, policing, not only in the country. I'm so sorry. How much is going to have to take your place? No. <laughs> Um, I will turn on the silly already sent this out, but I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. 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 Or East Frontage Road on the north side of Island Lake Road or Pine County 50 or North Shoreland Road to Twilight Lane, one mile in length. Feel that the speed on the road is extremely a safety hazard to the residents' survival. We feel the residents should be entitled to the same speed and safety that they receive along Sturgeon Lake, which on Pine County 46, which is 30. The road from the intersection of Pine County 46 and 51, one and a half miles, has been changed to 30 miles an hour with fewer residents, less than 15, and with a longer setback on the road than it is on 51, where the changes to 50 miles an hour for many of the residents greater, have, are, there's more than greater 35 people that live along that road. It makes no sense. Or that limits the speed to 35 miles an hour in a residential area. There was a speed study done during COVID in 2021 and the report generated in 2022. The study was done at certain times in which was irrelevant to what really takes place on the road. Um, there's been many instances of high speeds, accidents, people passing a no passing zone, bicycles, even getting the mail out of the mailbox or garbage is, is dangerous. No one moves over and the speeds are excessive over 50 miles an hour. The stretch of the road has become more populated with old residents, children, and pets, and houses are close to the road. This is zoned as a residential area and we're requesting the speed limit to be lowered to 30 miles an hour from 50. Uh, from Pine County 50 to Twilight Lane. We have attached signatures of 30 residents who live along Pine County stretch where we are asking it to be changed. No one, no one did not 
investigation that were asked. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll give it to Dave. Yes. Yeah, I'll just give you all this. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so okay. much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was supposed to take this one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Come on forward. My name is Gary Valvoda. I'm from Royalton Township. Um, Madam Chair, members of the board, at the last meeting, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, Mr. Ludwig, you asked a question about is zoning for morals. And in my hearing, you know, I think you asked something about, you know, is zoning, you said buildings, your property, and that. And I call attention to the Pine County Comprehensive Plan of 2017. Under adoption, it says, where is the Pine County Commission is recognized the necessity to promote the health, safety, and morals and general welfare through a comprehensive planning process. And this was signed by you back in 2017. Or, yeah, 2017. Um, in the comprehensive plan, chapter one, executive summary under the Pine County goals for the next 15 years, reduce crime and the prevalence of drugs in order to maintain a safe community. Whether it's legal or illegal, it's still a drug, I, I believe. Uh, no, no use. There is an adult use recorded under number 455332, an ordinance that you have. They don't have the new ordinance numbers, I guess, because it's from a while ago. But, you know, the, the, there are ordinances on morals also. Just bringing that point out. Pond County Zoning Ordinance 1.2, the purpose, the purpose of this ordinance is to protect the public health, safety, and general welfare through the following object objectives. 1.2.4, protect community appeal and property values from incompatible uses. We're in a residential area, it's going to impact if it's in a commercial area, you don't have that impact as far as value with other business and commercial enterprises next to them as much as industrial park or wherever it would be. And then 1.2.7, support the goals and recommendation of the Pine County Comprehensive Plan, reflecting back. And my question is, is are these just fluffy words or just feel good words or do we actually go by them? You know, when who and morals and that and such, you know, uh, we've got a zoning ordinance on, on adult use, but who would you rather meet down the road, a pervert or a pothead? I don't know. You know maybe neither one. I, I don't want either one. But that's where I'm at. And I just, and, and, and I didn't want, want to draw you out on it, but you signed that saying that we are looking at morals and other things, you know, when we draw up the comprehensive plan. That's all I meant. I, yeah. I, I, you know. And that's all I have. Thank you, Gary. Yeah. Anybody else? I just. Dick Gray from Royal Hilton. I sent you guys an email suggesting a moratorium until January 1st, because you can do that. And obviously, we need it, just like every other county does. But before I left today, I was not planning on talking. This article came up when it was on KSTV last night. I didn't watch it. It says, Insider, Culture at New Minnesota Cannabis Agency led to several staff members calling it quits. So the OCN doesn't even know what they're doing. And KSTP on the 14th, so you should be able to look it up. But it said that more than half of their team quit during pivotal time. This summer at the OCM, forcing medical marijuana patients to wait weeks for their medication. The insiders and working conditions at OCM, as the agents 
So Clover is a medical cannabis program and prepares to launch recreational sales next spring. We all loved our jobs. We wanted to stay, said Kim, um, who started in the medical cannabis program when the Minnesota Department of Health was in charge. The new state law moved the program and its employees from MDH to OCM over the summer. And this lady, I have no idea why they didn't just leave the medical canvas program intact as it was. She tells five investigates that she was part of a team of eight people that approved medical cannabis certifications. Up until last month, the state required patients to go through the certification process every year. As soon as the move to OCM took place, everything went downhill fast. They told us, hey, you're coming into our house. You're gonna play by our rules. The medical cannabis program had been up and running for quite a long time. It was working fine. We processed the applications within a day or two. Jeez. Yeah, time is up too. Right. Thank you for that site. Yeah, I don't look at that, but it just showed up today. So I figured I was supposed to tell that. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else want to speak? Public forum? See our revisions for the agenda. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dave Minky, County Administrator. There are several additions uh, and changes to the agenda. Uh, so if we could add consent agenda item number five, we were, uh, highlighted at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, if we could add consent agenda item number 7.1A, that's the new hire of uh, probation senior agent. On your handout, it's a correction to the regular agenda item number 2CI. It should be acknowledge the resignation uh, in your packet says acknowledge the resolution. So just a typographical correction. On regular agenda item 3.1, if we could add a uh, consideration of dental plan for 2025, uh, we did get uh, bids from uh, carriers and have a more attractive offer uh, that we're recommending. Uh, and if we could add regular agenda item number 7.1, a uh, review of proposed separation agreement of a pending arbitration hearing. And as noted in your handout, uh, you can choose to close that meeting if you wish. Uh, and if you do close the meeting, we do have Con Margaret Skelton, the county's labor attorney, uh, will be joining via Zoom for that. On the audit and financial statements, uh, the PowerPoint that Kelly will present. So, Dave, on this, with this, um, I believe that we need to close that meeting. Do we need, should we just do that now or should we decide you, to do that later? Um, Madam Chair, members of the board, you don't need to close the meeting. It's optional. If you want to close it, you can do it under the attorney client privilege provision of the law. And it would be probably most appropriate to do it at that point in the meeting. Okay, thank you. We have a motion. Um, Thanks, Matt. I'll second. Thanks, JJ. Are there any questions on any of the agenda? Not all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Approving the minutes for October 1st, the regular county board meeting, and the summary, and then the October 8th special meeting, um, and the minutes for publication. Josh. Um, we've got a motion by Steve, a second by Josh. Are there any questions on those? Not all those in Minutes of the board and correspondence. We've got the zoning board minutes from August 22nd. I'll move. I'll move. Second. Thanks, Josh. Are there any questions on those minutes? Not all those in favor say aye. All right, aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Then we've got the consent agenda. Are there any questions on the consent agenda? I'll move. Josh. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> got a motion by Steve. I'll second. Second by Josh. Once again, are there any questions on the consent agenda? Not all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. We are on the regular agenda. We've got the facility committee. 
would like to take that? Yeah. Um, we go back to the minutes briefly. I just want to make sure something isn't missed here. We do that, Madam Chair? Yep. Uh, the personnel committee, when were we going to approve those minutes? That's coming up. That's the next thing on your agenda under regular. Okay, gotcha. All right. So back to facilities. All right. Well, we met uh, October 2nd. Uh, we discussed uh, a couple things the courthouse uh, roof update, jail project discussion, and then we uh, talked about power a little bit, snow removal contracts. Um, I guess the big things is we decided to. Uh, to uh, hold off on the uh, on the roof to look at it again next year. It's currently not leaking or anything. It's going to be now. You know, it's always been looked at, and I think you guys do a great job looking at the facility and, and checking things out. Um, but we're going to just wait on that, push that out, and then also the jailhouse discussion. Um, you know, look at that again next year. Uh, good news on that is the cost has been going down on the jailhouse. Uh, no contracts were approved. Um, there's a few things that we skipped on. There was uh, some concern of some carpet that needed to be uh, replaced. We decided to hold off on that. And uh, Matt, is there anything I can add or change that you remember? Mm -hmm. Facilities? We covered that snow removal on the back. Yeah, the snow thing. removal. Then that, uh, we had a review of that power outage. The other one. There's one part of the courthouse, it sounds like, that does not really get used. It's a sidewalk area, and uh, it just seems like a, a lot of time being spent on it when it's not traveled. So we're just going to uh, close that area off. Which, which sidewalk? Is it the south end of this building? Madam Chair? Yeah, go ahead. So, in, in front of, when you walk in the front of the courthouse to your left, is stairways that go down to the south parking lot area. So it would be those stairs in the winter. That, uh, and then additionally, we've historically contracted out the snow removal of the sidewalks and uh, facility supervisor, uh, Pete Umbright, is wanting to take that in house. We got some uh, equipment to help with that, uh, but those stairs, don't seem like they're used a lot. And so I think we wanted to do a trial winter and see if we can not remove that snow because it's a lot of work with that stairways. So it's the stairways after the handicap access. Yes, yep, yes. Okay. So the handicap, access to the handicap ramp would be maintained. Perfect. Uh, and so the, the south parking lot is where some employees park and they have badge access into that doorway there. Uh, and so it just, it seems like worth trying to save the labor uh, to do that long stair staircase. Yeah, and then I touched on what uh, Mr. Ludwig commented with the power outage review. There was a power outage, and there's backup power, you know, to keep the essential things running. And there was a uh, a mix up on how things were hooked up, where they they had lost temporarily lost some uh, electricity to some equipment. So it they dispatch. Yeah, so they have that figured out now uh, between the electrician and uh, Pete. Sounds like they got a good handle on everything. Did you say it was to dispatch? Yeah. Wow, that could be. Bad. They don't have it wired to the backup. Okay. Just because uh, I think the dispatch for that whole part down there was an afterthought. Yeah, that was all going to originally be jail, so they had it wasn't set up that way. So what they did it with an extension cord, like so they just put in a few minutes. You know, it was less than fifteen, I think. But they're they're working on setting up a switch and a link if that's going to happen. Okay, good. Are there any questions on the facility committee? I have a motion. Um, I make a motion to approve. I'll move that. Thanks, Matt. I'll second. Thanks, JJ. I had a motion by Matt, a second by JJ. Are there, once again, any questions? Madam Chair, just for clarity, there were three action items on the agenda that the motion is covering. Is that correct? Just approve the minutes, I think. No, so you've, you've got three action items. Yeah, we're pulling it off. Yeah. Uh, review the replacement of the courthouse roof, delay the jail remodel project, and close the sidewalk steps on the south half. Is that your motion, Matt? I will move that. And that's your second, JJ? Yes. Perfect. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Personnel committee. Don't you take it? Get worse. 
All right, so we did meet on October 7th and we made the following recommendations. And the Auditor Treasurer Land Resources uh, acknowledged the resignation of Land Resources Manager Mike Gaynor, effective no later than December 23rd, 2024. Approve the backfill of the position, any subsequent vacancies that may occur due to internal promotion or lateral transfer, um, and approve the update of the land resources manager job description. And then in health and human services, acknowledge the resignation of public case aid Rebecca Mallory, effective September 6, 2024, and approve the backfill of the position, any subsequent vacancies that may occur due to internal promotion or lateral transfer. Also on health and services, acknowledge the resignation of public health educator Haley Friedland, effective January 9, 2025, and approve the backfill, backfill of, the, of a social worker position within the Children's Services Unit. Um, also on health and human services, approve the revised chemical health resource coordinator job description. Uh, and then in the sheriff's office, the jail acknowledged the resignation part-time court security officer, Bill Shire, Shireman. Sorry, I <laughs> butchered that. Uh, effective September 24, 2024, and approve the backfill of the position. Any subsequent vacancies that may occur due to internal promotion or lateral transfer. Also acknowledge the resignation of part-time probationary corrections officer, Michael Glockskin. Uh, effective September 19, 2024, and approve the backfill of the position. Any subsequent vacancies that may occur due to internal promotion or lateral transfer. And also acknowledge the resignation of Assistant Jail Administrator Heather Immel, effective October 1st, and approve the backfill of the position. Any subsequent vacancies that may occur due to internal promotion or lateral transfer. Um, with that, I will make a motion to do all them action items. Um, then we can talk about the rest of it. And I will second that. All right, got a motion by Matt, a second by, or a motion by Josh, a second by Matt. Are there any questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. And then we've got the four tier health insurance rates. So Madam Chair, members of the board, um, I think you're all aware of this. The insurance committee has made some uh, periodic reports. There was a desire to look at the four tiered structure uh, to allow uh, more options for employees. All of the seven bargaining units that are on county insurance have approved an MOA to move to the four tiered system. Uh, it's set up so that the county's bottom line cost remains unchanged. Uh, it does change the contribution to the various four tiers, but the total uh, county contribution uh, should remain consistent, knowing, of course, that whether we change or not, that's always dependent upon which employees elect to take which coverage, right, of which we don't have a lot of control over. Uh, also, uh, it would end new uh, employees, join, it would end, end, end employees going on to the VIVA plan. So we have, I think it's about eight employees on the VIBA plan, they're you know, grandfathered in, if you will, uh, but we would not allow new folks to join the VIBA plan. So if you're agreeable to that, uh, you can make that, uh, decide that, or make make that motion today. I think the health insurance new rate structure. Thank you, Matt. I'll second. Thanks, Josh. Are there any questions on this? I, I got ahead, Josh. And I know we've had a few discussions about it, but it seems like everybody on the uh, insurance committee, this is what they wanted, right? Yeah. yeah. They, they had them, yeah. And I know. I think there's an agreement with all the unions. Yeah. So, okay. okay. And this started kind of in negotiations last year, didn't it? I mean, it, it, we, another bargaining unit was going, that was part of the reason they left the county plan was to go to a four or a tiered rate system. So we kind of scratched our heads a little bit and said, maybe this is what people want or, or maybe it's not, but apparently not in the insurance committee, but apparently that is the direction. Yeah, and thank, thank you for the history because I know this has been discussed 
numerous times over the last several years. And it usually ran into two roadblocks. One, there was usually an increase in the insurance rates that we had to factor in. So it was hard to do the rate increase and then finesse the rates so you can have the four tiers. Uh, and then we typically ran out of time to negotiate because we have to be agreement with the seven bargaining units. And so the, the circumstances lined up where we don't need to do a rate increase on the base rate. And so it allowed more flexibility for Gallagher to set up a tiered rate structure that most folks, uh, if you have single coverage, you should have basically no change. And I'm talking kind of in generalities and looking at, at Jackie a little bit. <laughs> if you have currently family coverage, the move to spouse or dependent coverage from family, you should see a reduction in your premium. And if you had family coverage and you stay on family coverage, you will see a little bit of an increase in coverage or in premium costs. So the only people that are gonna see increases are the full families. The ones that are gonna see the decreases are the um, employee and spouse or employee and children. I think employee and children were the biggest decrease, wasn't it Jackie? Yes. Yeah, and then employee and spouse will have a smaller decrease and then employee with family will see an increase in their, I think I said increase for family or for, yeah, yeah but it, it, so the two will decrease and the one will increase. Matt? Oh, well, I, think, well, I thought you raised your hand. No, I, I think the important thing is like Dave said, it's like the, our, our premium that we put in there stays the same. Right. It just, it's going to shift around inside all the policies. And some people, there's going to, some people are going to see a change. But they, they have the choice to pick it. They're gonna, yes. I think I think it goes back about 18 years that I know oh. that we've been talking about um, employee plus one, employee plus kids, employee and spouse. Right. You know, it, because there was such a huge gap between the cost differentials. And, and so I'm glad we finally got there it kind of makes sense um what was i going to say i just lost a train of thought other than i appreciate all the work the health insurance committee did i do other than i am a i'm a family person so it uh uh it will want it once again affect myself um but it, it just does kind of show the demographics of what the changing is where you know the it used to be family or single and now you got spouses you got children whatever um just shows the way that's going on the other side of it um i just wanted to say thank you to the insurance committee for the biggest thing that i don't think people are realizing this year we're having a zero rate increase um and still adding to our reserves decently enough to get it stable so um, that just shows a lot of work that's been done with that committee um, in the last couple of years when we went self-insured and we're seeing some payoffs now. So we're, we're in control of it and it's going the right way. So thank you. Thank you guys. Actually, I look at that as a huge blessing because that means our employees have been healthier. Yeah, right? I, and I so, think that's the important yeah, part. So just to know that our employees are taking care of themselves and that they're healthier is the bonus of, of bonuses. So, all right, we have a motion by Matt, a second by Josh. Once more, any questions on this? All those in favor for the four-tier insurance rates, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Um, 2023 audit and financial oh, yeah. statement. We have the dental that we added. Oh, yes. Okay. So, so that's the three, oh, three plus one. Sorry. Uh, if I may, uh, Madam Chair, yes. members of the board. So we were looking at a substantial rate increase for dental. I think it was like 29%. And so Gallagher marketed our dental plan and dental insurance is optional and 100% at the expense of the employee. And so they got some competitive uh, offers back. And so the best one uh, came from Humana. It maintains the annual benefit maximum of $1,000, uh, but then does actually decrease the, uh, the cost of the premium to the employee. And so we're recommending uh, going with the Humana $1,000 proposal. I'll move I'll that. I'll second it. Okay, motion by Matt, second by Steve. Are there any questions on that? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? 
Motion carried. Thank you. Now we're going to the 2023 audit and financial statements. And uh, Kelly Schroeder should be online to do the presentation. Morning, Kelly. Good morning. How are you guys? Good. How are you? Great. So I am going to share my presentation here. Uh -huh. It's not as easy when it's it's not my friend Ryan doing it. <laughs> um, okay, so hopefully you guys can see that. Yes. Perfect. Sounds great. So you all should have gotten a copy today of the actual financial statements. I think you would have received them electronically a couple weeks ago as well, but you got a printed bound copy today. Um, but I just have a presentation that quickly kind of gives you an overview of them and talks through them a little bit because obviously there's a lot there. Um, and so just kind of pulled out some high points. Um, so to start with, Right, my, there we go. So to start with, the financial statements um, have several different sections to them. Um, so the actual financial statement starts with the management analysis portion. And so if you're going to read anything in the financial statements, that's really the piece that I suggest people read because that's kind of the layman's terms, the nice explanations um, of the financial statements put together. So that's kind of the great section. Um, there's the basic financial statements. It looks at them as a government-wide, and then it also looks by fund. Um, and then there's the required supplementary information, and that's things like our proprietary funds, um, our fiduciary funds, um, just like some of our, our liabilities with debt, leases, all sorts of things in those sections. Um, and then at the end of the document in pages um, 119 and through 127 is the actual audit opinion. And we will talk through that here um, towards the end of my presentation as to what that all means and what it says. Um, in the audit opinion, they break out the actual financial statements and then the federal awards because we receive more than $750,000 of federal funds. They have to do a specific audit of our federal funds. Um, so it's kind of broken down into two portions. Um, this is just a quick overview of where our revenues come from. And obviously the lower left is 2022 and the upper right is 2023. Um, and it just shows where our revenues come from. And I really, I always appreciate looking at the property tax piece. Um, you'll notice um, in 2022, about 40% of our revenues came from property taxes. Um, however, in 2023, that decreased to just 36% of our revenues came from property taxes. Meaning while, yes, we did have a property tax levy increase, we found other revenues as well to help pay for some of those expenses. Um, so that's always great to see. Um, the next slide looks at our expenses um, and, and breaks them down by um, expense type. And, and so you'll see, you know, we've got public safety. And my 2023 graph is in a little bit different order than my 2022 graph, unfortunately. It kind of bugged me. So my 2023 graph goes from largest to smallest, where the 2022 is just kind of all mixed together. Um, but you can kind of, you, the categories are the same. So like if you look at public safety in 2022, that was 29% of our expenses. For example, in 2023, that was 27% of our expenses. Um, same with highways and streets stayed exactly the same. Human services, um, chain, you know, stayed exactly the same. Um, and you can kind of see how, how that all changes. Um, you will note for 2023, economic development really bumped up um, from 1% in 2022 to 6% in 2023. And that is really just a function of those broadband grants that we received and the spending of those during 2023. Um, so that's, that's why you're seeing that really big jump is because the broadband's put in the economic development category. And stop me if you guys have any questions as I'm talking here. Um, within the report on pages 73 to 75, we do have a budget to actuals that is shown. Um, and I just, it, I pulled it out by the major funds that we work through. Um, so you look at the general fund and it's interesting because you look at our budget expenditures were about $20.8 million and our actual expenditures were $22.4 million. So you would at first see that and think, wow, we did really bad in 2022. However, there's a lot more to that story. And so some of it is told um, down at the bottom. For 2023, there was a new audit standard or a new financial reporting standard that we had to implement. 
um, for our software contracts um, and our equipment leases. So like our, our big equipment lease mainly is like our copiers um, and then our software contracts. Um, it's amazing. And Ryan can attest to this of how many of the computer programs we have. We have like maintenance or software contracts that go with them. Um, and so depending on the terms of those, we now had to list those as a liability or an expense on our financial statements. Um, so in the general fund, it looks like we were almost $1.2 million overspent. However, 1.1 million of that is from those adjustments of looking at the future costs of those leases and our software contracts and actually recognizing those expenses now. Um, so once we take that out, the, the overage is not nearly what it looks like. The overage is about $33,400. Um, but with that overage came an additional a large amount of revenue. So sometimes throughout the year, we find out about grant programs that are available that we hadn't budgeted from, um, different things that come up. So yes, we spent $33,000 more in 2023 than we had planned for, but we also got over $2 million of additional revenue than we had planned for. Um, so it's there's a lot more to the story than looking at that and saying, oh my, um, we were off course um, because really we were more than on course. Um, and as we go through the additional slides here, you'll see that. Um, Road and Bridge, um, you will see that their expenditures show that they overspent, again, project related. Um, as we talk about with Road and Bridge every year, um, we don't get overly concerned um, on, on their expenditures because so much of it is related to projects and Mark's got that plan that he's carrying out. Um, and Health and Human Services, they came in just $130,000 less than um, was planned. Um, so they were under budget. Um, and I always marvel at that because it seems the last several years, Becky has ended up budgeting to spend reserves. Um, and due to her management um, and financial oversight, um, like we did in 2023, rather than spending reserves, she was able to add to her reserves. Um, so that's great to see. Um, fund balances. So this is something we talk about a lot. Um, usually we just focus on the general fund, but I wanted to highlight, um, you know, kind of our main funds that we talk about quite a bit. Um, so in the general fund, you'll see where we started 2023. You'll see the change and then you'll see the end of 2023. Um, so you'll note like the general fund bumped up very nicely, um, road and bridge, um, we've talked about that some that we're struggling a little bit just with our projects and our state aid advancements and things to keep those things in line. Um, Health and Human Services bumped up very nicely, the land fund bumped up some. Um, it's important to note that land fund bump up is in those restricted accounts. So if you remember annually we've been setting aside funds for like the parks and recreation for blight cleanup for timber development. And so that increase you see in the land fund is those types of increases. Otherwise, the land fund shouldn't increase. The funds are sent out to the cities, townships, and um, the general fund. So you'll notice that. Um, you'll notice the total of all funds to increase nicely. Um, and then my next three lines down there are just, you take that end balance and you break it into different categories. So in the general fund, we have a significant amount of funds that are restricted. And so what that means is those funds are tied up based on a grant agreement um, or the uh, or a statute that where we got those funds. So they're tied up for only specific uses. And that's not something that we have a choice about because we got those funds with those restrictions. Um, the assigned balance is something that we do have control over. So that assigned balance is specifically the jail canteen fund. Um, so I believe it was about... I think it was maybe 2020 or 2021, um, rather than when the jail through their canteen and communications previously, if there was excess revenue there, it just rolled into the general fund unassigned balance. Um, yet we know that expenses come up in the jail. Um, all of a sudden we need to replace all the mattresses or there's some kitchen equipment or something that breaks. Um, so you all had decided back then to make specific things in the jail. So that's what that assigned $247,000 is. Um, and then the unrestricted unassigned at the bottom there for the general fund, for example, at five point almost six million dollars are those funds that can be used for any anything. Um, Road and bridge, um, we can kind of talk about that. Um, you know, they've got a lot uh, a, a little bit that's restricted. Some of that, well, actually, a lot of that is inventory, for example, of parts and things that they have in their shop. 
Um, and then they're assigned unrest unassigned, unrestricted is just kind of that operating dollars that they have. Um, health and human services, again, she's got a little bit that's restricted or assigned. That's all kind of related back to the home visiting programs where we got those funds. And so they have to go back into home visiting programs. Um, otherwise, in health and human services, the rest of their funds are considered assigned because they need to be used for health and human services expenses. Um, again, land fund, you'll just see um, those dollars um, they're, they're the increase rolled into the restricted and committed loss. As we look throughout all of our funds um, did increase to about $2, $2 million. Um, and you'll notice at the bottom of these slides, I do note as you're looking through the financial statements, what pages you can get this information from just so you can cross-reference it. Um, I liked, um, so this is something that we talk a lot about during budget times um, because it was an issue in the past. So in the past, um, you'll notice that my chart starts at 2011. Um, but you'll note that unrestricted fund balance and uh, noting the percent of our expenditures in the general fund. So back in 2011, things were a bit grim in that we only had 5.9% in fund balance. Um, and when you're at that point, um, uh, from week to week, it's questionable. Um, you know, every week, which 2011, it wasn't as high, but, um, you know, today's payroll every two weeks is, or every month is about $600,000. So, um, it, it gets a little sketchy when you have a very low fund balance like that. Um, we've talked about this as well. The Office of the State Auditor um, recommends a fund balance um, like 35 to 50% or like five months of revenues is how they look at it. Um, thinking back to 2011, that wasn't feeling super attainable. So the county board then passed a resolution aiming for 20 to 35% of expenditures. And you, you know, we worked rather hard um, and we got there in 2015 and have kind of hovered around the same place since 2015. Um, so you'll notice 2023, we were at 24.8% of our fund balance, unassigned fund balance um, would equal um, our expenditures. Um, cash and in investments. So just, and this is just a snapshot at the end of the year, of course, at 1231, where our cash and investments sat. Um, so we have several different types of places we hold money. Um, so the first is the magic account. Um, so that's the Minnesota Association of Governments Investing for Counties. Um, that's really the account where like all of our state aids and a lot of our federal dollars roll into from the state of Minnesota. Um, and that's that's a money market account. And so it's been inching the interest rates on that money market account. Um, so on that money market account, it has been paying very well um, with the increases in interest rates. So it's been kind of nice because I've been able to just hold the funds there and have them do a lot of work for us with earning interest. And it's been nice. But we also want to look a little more long term and think about funds that we don't necessarily need today for operating expenses for liquid cash and lock them up in different investments so that we can keep keep getting those nice high interest rates, even though when interest rates start to dwindle, we still have them locked in. So with that, it's a little bit of a balancing act, um, but sometimes we do purchase certificates of deposit at various banks. So as of 1231, we had about $4.8 million in certificates of deposit, um, almost $4 million in federal bonds. Um, and then the deposits that it lists about 2.5 million, that's really just like our operating checking account. Um, and then, of course, our changed funds, which is just our petty cash that we here have here at the courthouse to make change with. So total on 1231 of 2023, we had a total balance of cash of $22.6 million, uh, most of which, again, was sitting in that magic account just because it was it was between January through the end of March. We have very little revenues that come in, um, but yet we have bond payments that are due and a lot of um full contracts, like Ryan's got a lot of his software contracts that he pays for in January that are for the whole year. Um, so we do need a lot of liquid cash at the beginning of the year because there's very little revenues coming in, but yet we have some big, shows you a copy of what our interest earnings have been historically. Um, and so that 2023 number is super great to look at. Um, you know, it was, I don't want to say it was easy, but it really was because interest rates just in that magic account um, and make well over 5% um, on it month to month. Um, and I'm, you know, again, you do that kind of dance of how much money do I need liquid? Can I walk up some more month ago or so? We had the Fed made an interest rate cut. And so now some of those interest rates we can see are starting to dwindle. Um, like the magic fund was well over 5%. And now it's like at 4.8 from 2019 to 2022, it was under 1% a lot. Um, our debt, which we talk about a lot, quite a bit. A lot of this we talk about quite a bit, but 
Of course, I show our three bonds that we have, um, the jail bond, the capital improvement program center, um, and then our 2020 courthouse bond. Um, and just to kind of clear up any confusion on those years, like the jail bond and the courthouse bonds, those were refunded bonds. So obviously we didn't like start uses that we took advantage of in those years and refinanced them or refunded them. Um, and so you can see, I always like the very far right column, the payoff year, um, because it's feeling a little bit more. And you can kind of see at the bottom of the slide as well, uh, how they, the way that our bonds are structured is that our payment is pretty level every single year. Um, so it kind of hovers around that 2.3, 2.4 million dollars for our principal and interest payments a year. And that is how the bonds are structured all the way up to their payoffs. Um, so on to the actual audit part. And so this is really just the big overview page. Um, and so it notes that on our financial statements, we received an unmodified opinion, which we'll talk about on the next slide, what that means. Um, it did note on our internal controller for financial reporting that we had a material through those when we talk about the findings of the audit. Um, and then for the federal awards, because again, we have a single audit because we received so much over $750,000 of federal funds. Um, we have, they look at our federal awards separately. Um, so you'll notice they did not note a material weakness in our federal awards, but they did notice a significant deficiency. And really the significant deficiency in our federal awards is tied back to the financial statements as well. And we'll we'll talk over the details of what happened with those things. But overall, our, our audit opinion on our federal programs was also unmodified. So I'll just advance quickly to the next um, the next slide, which kind of talk, which talks about those audit opinions. And so, and the best of them all, the most that you want is that unmodified opinion, um, the green one. And so we are pleased to say that we did receive an unmodified opinion on our financial statements and our federal awards that we had, which we will talk through next. So on to the findings. So the first finding, um, which was a material weakness, um, related. There were three items that contributed to this. Two of them were in the Road and Bridge Fund. Um, the two in the Road and Bridge Fund um, were, the first one was that um, during our accrual period, so January through March, of course, we're receiving funds and we are spending funds that were really for the previous year's expenditures. So during that time period, you know, our, our accountants, um, they do their best at catching those expenses and getting them flagged of, you know, during 2024, this was a 2023 expense or revenue. However, we also always do an annual review of that and make sure all of those things are caught. Um, unfortunately, um, we had a, um, that we had noted that it came in February and for whatever reason, when it was looked at, it was thought, oh, that didn't get flagged as a 2023 revenue. So when that happens, we have to go in and make a journal entry or like an adjustment to our financials to make sure we're reflecting that, you know, we got funds in 24, but they were actually for 23. So we went in and did that, um, which shows we had money that we, we had a receivable money that we got later, but it needed to be attributed back. However, unfortunately, the auditors pointed out that that original transaction was flagged as 2023 by us going in and doing that extra entry because we thought it was missed, that flag was missed, we now have doubled our receivable balance uh, because it was done once automatically by the system because the flag was there and then it was done once. Um, and then the next one um, was also in the Road and Bridge Fund and it was a contract payable. Um, so there's a $770,000 contract payment that we made in the winter for work that was completed in 2023. And this one's just kind of the opposite of the first one of it was not flagged as a 2023 payment. And when we did our review, we didn't catch it as a 2023 payment. So we missed it of counting it as an expense for 2023. Um, and then in the COVID fund, um, another issue that CBDG grant that we're working with a place for you on. Um, and I think Leslie talked about that um, at maybe the last board meeting um, of those grants she's been working through. Um, but as part of that, a place for you grant, the expenditures came in significantly or the, the quotes came in significantly higher than the original grant was for. Um, so Leslie has worked very hard to figure out how to make this still work. And part of the way to make it still work was a place for you was going to bring in some of their own cash um, to, to the problem of, OK, Pine County with the grants paying $100,000 of this invoice and a place for you, you're going to pay $50,000 of this invoice. A place for you is simply just sent us their portion sent to Pine County their portion so that we could just pay the invoices. However, we didn't spend. So they sent us the, that money in 2023 and the project was still ongoing through the end of the year and in money that we hadn't spent a place for you. Um, and so really, we should have recorded those funds as unearned revenue. So it was revenues we got, but yet we didn't have an expenditure for came up. And so all three of these things, unfortunately, do lead to a material weakness in that 
the numbers we originally reported to the state auditor were wrong. Um, and so, I mean, I can't sugarcoat that any differently in that they truly were wrong. Um, think, you know, we're very thankful for the state auditors for looking over it. Um, as part of the audit, then we have to put together a corrective action plan. Um, so we have addressed all three of these already um, in that working much closer with the highway department on those receivables and those expenditures during that review funds. We've already made that corrective change within our financial system so that it will just roll forward into 2024, correct? Are there any questions on that? All right, I'm gonna move on to the second finding. Um, and the second finding um, is, is a little frustrating to me, I guess, well, the third finding is the most frustrating, but the second one, um, so we yeah, significant, this was their significant deficiency finding. And so all that means is the numbers were correct. However, the procedures potentially were not followed. So every year within our financial state, our processes, and we take them year to year and just make updates. So, um, you know, all of our financial processes have to be documented step by step of what we do. And literally the state auditors then take our step by step directions that we told them we do and go through them. And this is one of those things that they went through and said, wait, it says you're doing that, but you're not actually. So again, every single month we have to make journal entries to make corrections. So um, for example, like we have it truly some of their wages should go to a certain grant. So then we do a journal entry at the end of the month to move those wages over because the the uh, our payroll system can't like change every month of, well, this month, 12 hours should go charge it to one account. And then at the end of the month, we'd fix it based on the employee's time records. Um, and so within our step-by-step -step processes, there was a step in there that said the journal entries that the health and me. Um, and we did that pre-COVID, um, but then COVID happened, um, says that we just never brought back pre-COVID because it just is much easier not to do it. Um, but since that was documented in our process and we weren't doing it, it did come up as a finding. Um, again, that was not followed. Um, so we've re-implemented those journal entry reviews effective like immediately as soon as they brought this up. Um, and so we do them electronically now. Previously, they were always printed out and put in my inbox um, before COVID. And now we are just doing them electronically and that will work just fine. So that's been addressed as well. Um, and then the last finding is, is my most a requirement of federal funds is when you pay a vendor um, according to a certain federal regulation over a certain dollar amount, you have to check to make sure that that vendor is and we had this exact same finding in 2021. Um, and in 2021, we got it. And I 100% agreed with it, um, understood it, because that was just a piece of doing that suspension and debarment check that we didn't know about funds um, with the ARPA and the, and the CARES Act funds. And so it was just one of those things that it's like, well, it's an audit finding. It's a learning moment. We'll take it and move on. Um, however, the reason that I find this one frustrating is that they looked at invoices that we paid in 2023 and said, well, did you do the suspension and debarment check before you entered into the contracts with these companies or decided to purchase this stuff from these companies? And my answer was no, because we entered into those contracts in 2022 prior to getting our 2021 audit finding. Um, and they didn't like that answer. Um, so it was very frustrating for me because like we we couldn't have fixed it because we didn't get that finding until September of 2022. And these contracts were entered into the summer of 2022. And then we made payments on them in 2023. So there was like, it was like a catch 22. There was, there was no way for us to fix it um, because we didn't know about it when we entered into the contracts. But since we made payments on those contracts in 2023, they, they brought it back, um, which is, I guess, their prerogative. But um, and so with this, I mean, we've we've added steps into our process in that any expenditure going through the COVID fund, um, I just review that suspension and debarment um, for every vendor, and um, that will that will address it. And as we go forward with federal funds, we'll just make sure whenever we're spending federal funds, even if we don't think it's going to be over that twenty five thousand dollar threshold, we will just check it and keep documentation of checking it. Um, there's not that many transactions, anyways. So just an overview of, of the financial statements. Um, so kind of some highlights, some positives are that I mentioned earlier that our reliance on property tax um, pretty nicely between 2022 to 2023. Um, we had some really nice increases in the general fund and the health and human services fund. Um, even though in both those cases, we weren't budgeted to add anything to the reserves, but yet we still did through that, through some great financial management. 
Um, and then those interest rates on the investments, um, you had seen that over a million dollars of interest was paid um, in 2023. And so it's really just capitalizing on that, on that, on the time when, when they're just sitting there. Um, and that is all that I have. Are there questions of things I didn't cover? Not seen any, Kelly. I thought you did a great job explaining it. Yes. Yes. So, Madam Chair, you could do a motion to accept the audit if you're satisfied. Yeah. Is there a motion to accept the audit, Steve? I'll, I'll move that. I'll second. Yes. Motion by Steve and a second by Josh to accept the audit. Are there any questions? Once again, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carried. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you. Now we have Dave with the third quarter. Madam Chair, members of the board, um, we're, so we were talking about a year ago now. Now we're just going to talk about the last nine months. And at this point, at the end of September, the county budget looks really pretty good. Uh, and Kelly noted, um, you know, good fiscal management a number of times in her audit presentation. And I think um, this, you know, year to date represents that as well. So chart one just shows uh, expenditure and revenue by major fund. Um, every expenditure for the funds are below 75%. Uh, and if you look at the total and scratch your head, you, you go, well, those expenditures below 75% seem like they're adding up to over 75% at that 81%. And the total overall just captures some non-budgeted expenditures that are approved. Uh, and so things like there's a couple million dollars of ARPA expenditures that you approved that aren't in the 2024 budget. Uh, so there's no concern there. Uh, next slide, chart number two, uh, just shows the revenue in select departments of the general fund through September 30th. Those are the lines or the bars. The line is the average of the previous uh, four years. And so most places look like they're tracking pretty consistently year to year. You'll see the share off. There's a gap between the average and the current year. Um, the first week in October, we got a $400 uh, payment for state aid for the sheriff's state aid. So that's just a timing issue. Uh, if that would have hit a week before that uh, would have bumped up the bar. And then probation uh, is a little bit funky with how there was additional aid for probation that was funded through the legislature that was actually paid in 2023. So the 2024 amount uh, is not reflecting that previous year payment. Uh, the third chart looks at expenditures in departments of the general fund. The bars are 2024, and then the line is the five-year average. Uh, and you can see everything is pretty consistent. Um, the IT recorder and planning and zoning are above 75%. Uh, those aren't really concerns in the recorder, for example. That's the spending of the uh, compliance and technology fund uh, so it doesn't impact operating budget. The planning and zoning, uh, these expenditures are the septic grants that uh, come to you for approval and that those amounts just are outside of the budget. And then the, uh, what was the third one? Oh, the IT uh, is above 75%, uh, but that's still reflective of much of their expenditures are done early in the year for contracts, et cetera. So there's no uh, concerns on the expenditures. And then chart number four just shows health and human services by its major divisions uh, and everything there looks really pretty good. Uh, Kelly highlighted uh, how the HHS fund balance is very healthy. Our revenue recapture uh, has been very good. Uh, and you can see a little bit of that, a little bit of that reflected here because there's a significant lag on the reimbursements. Uh, but to be, you know, at or near 60% at this point of the year is really good. Uh, all in all, at nine months in, I think the 2024 budget uh, is very positive. I welcome any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to go into commissioner updates. Um, we have Lakes and Pines annual meeting. Well, that annual meeting <laughs> happened at the same time we were still having county board meeting. Oh. So I called after I got 
done with the county board meeting and, and it lasted about 20 minutes. Yeah. An election of officers is basically we knew that all that was going to happen. So I didn't miss much. Okay. East Central Regional Juveniles. I didn't go to the meeting, but I went over the minutes, so I'll give you the update. Um, Terry covered the guys. The cuts and bolts that's going to affect us is they approved a 15% increase in fees. So we're going to go up to 375 a bed for member and 455 a bed for non member. So there's there was a lot of discussion involved with that. And uh, it was brought up by other other counties that, you know, why did we find this out so late? You know, because we're all doing our budgeting this time of year. And so, the, but Anoka doesn't typically set their levy till like in December or something. But the Anoka County Board sets these rates back to that because they own that thing. So that's what it is. So that, but next year, the increase this year, kind of a catch up because nothing can keep up with a 4%. It isn't all salaries either. There's other costs and programming and things like that. But um, following year, we shouldn't see that kind of increase again. Um, the other big ticket item was the elevator was failing and it, no parts and stuff like that. So they had to redo the elevator, which is $151,000, but they took that out of capital reserve. Um, so other than that, it was just pretty much the normal. Okay. Thank you. Um, Greater Minnesota Parks and Trails annual meeting. Did you make it, Steve? No. I didn't either. They have it during other yeah. meetings. County board meeting going. Yeah. Um, Soil and Water Conservation District. Yeah, it was October 9th. Uh, I got the draft minutes. If anybody wants to look at them thoroughly. Um, during public comment, there was a situation brought up where there's some jump cars, oil, fluids leaking into the ground within a shoreland area. And within the uh, the uh, floodplain up along the river in Sturgeon Lake, uh, so the soil and water is looking into it. Where was that at? Uh, what was this? Remember that new boat landing or the canoe landing is on, on Denham Crossing, right up the river? Yeah, yeah, right about right in that area, right there. Oh, okay. What was that look? A bunch of cars and stuff being like processed, taken Duncan, apart. Duncan. Yeah, Duncan. yeah, Duncan. 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 yeah, not not really certain. So they're they're checking into it. Um, just a great concern with that river there. It's both within the shoreland area, the distance from the river, and it's also a floodplain. Yeah. So, oh. so we're looking at that. Um, hired a uh, Southern Water Hired New Water Resources uh, person, Krista Arn, hired. She starts on the 14th of October. Um, everything else is pretty much business as usual. I got the draft minutes if anybody wants to uh, check in. Sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Fall district meeting um, was good. It was a long drive. It was a beautiful drive, but it was a long drive. Um, the, the things that um, that our district chose to support for our policy committees are the EMS system, you know, doing the EMS services and getting that taken care of, uh, mental health through public health. Um, there were two of them. There was one for, um, was it transportation? No. I can't remember. I don't remember. Um, but the one, so they had two of them, and they really should be together, but they wanted to see which one people thought. So it, it's more on the housing and getting places for people with mental health. And then the SSIS system update was another one. And I can't, do you remember the other ones? I don't either. Um, but that was that was a big one. The other thing that we talked about, about the paperwork here, um, is where people were at with their, um, with their increases for their budgets. And it was anywhere from, um, actually, I'll just pass this around. So this has, um, like, eight, Anoka County approved a 16.86 with the hopes to reduce them. So a lot of them, they, they plan for 12%, and they're hoping to go between or below 10. But this is, this is where everybody else is with their budget increases for the year. And those are the ones that they turned them in. I added a couple of them to oh. it um, for the meeting. Um, all in all, it was a good meeting. Um, they did talk about we're gonna we are gonna see an increase from AMC. It'll be voted on on November first, um, but they're looking at two thousand dollars for Pine County, which is really minimal compared to what we get back. Um, anything else that you can think of? Uh, just a note on the spring meeting. Typically, they're on Thursdays. 
the spring meeting is going to be on a Wednesday, the day before the Juneteenth holiday. Uh, and so just if you're in that expectation of Thursday, it's on the commissioner calendar already, but it's a Wednesday versus a Thursday. And district one is always first. And this right. time we're going to be very last. Oh, and really? Yep. And it will be in Lake County. Okay. So that'll be, that'll be and, a different one. What, just going back to levies, uh -huh. what, what is everybody saying? I mean, or what did they say there? This is, this is insane. So a lot of it is wages. Um, if you go to um, Aiken County, there's is their new um, justice center. Um, so a few of them are justice centers. Um, it was kind of interesting. I'm trying to think of um, which county it is that they're putting in it. They're looking at a new justice center and it's going to be huge, but they're at 0% because they figured that they could do it without an increase. And it's like, ouch, that's going to be interesting. Um, so, and then wages and the health insurance, a lot of them had some pretty big increases on health insurance. However, Aiken County proved to us that they can lower, they lowered theirs. So we thought we were doing good at zero. They went down further than that. Really? So on yeah. Health insurance. On their health insurance. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but the majority of it is wages and then um, lots of justice centers being built. A lot of them. Thanks. Law library. Uh, I missed it. And apparently a few others did. They didn't have a quorum. Oh, okay. I don't, were you there? I was. You were? Okay. Yeah, it's only two of us, so I had to rescheduled. Oh, okay. <laughs> I had a doctor's appointment, so I, I apologize. Um, Central Minnesota Jobs and Training. Um, we are going to get you caught up a little bit. So Central Minnesota Jobs and Training, about um, almost like nine, ten months ago, um, we found out that we were missing a lot of money. There was a lot of money that was not accounted for. Um, because of that, we had to have a forensic audit done by deed. Um, and we couldn't really talk about it because there was the possibility of an investigation being done. And so it needed to not be something that was on the record with our counties. Um, so since then, we've hired a different auditor's company to come in to look at all of the books and to figure out where everything was at. And it's, it's um, the part that was really frustrating for me was our auditor that came into Central Minnesota Jobs and Training for years said, you guys do an amazing job. We just want to use everything that you do and show everybody else how to do it right because what you do is incredible. And then to find out that we're like $550,000 was unaccounted for. Um, and that's close to the amount. It's not the exact amount. So anyways, we um, brought in a new auditor. What happened was the person that was the treasurer at that time was taking the money from the grants and putting it into the wrong, she put it into a fund, but then they'd pay out of the wrong fund or they, it was just fund mismanagement, but the money is there. There's no embezzlement. There's no um, anything else that's been found other than the fact that it was just not put into the appropriate places. So um, that's kind of the update on where Central Minnesota Jobs and Training and the deed should have their forensic audit done. We were hoping to have it by now, um, but they're hoping now that we'll have it within the next couple of weeks. And Dina is the new administrative um, director, and she will be here. She'll be setting up a meeting to come in to talk to us about what, what all they've been doing. But um, she's doing an amazing job. And the staff is just very, um, they're working so hard to get things set straight so that there are no issues going forward. It is causing issues with the grants because we haven't been able to complete our audit because the person that does the audit aren't willing to do anything until the forensic audit is done. And um, so we're hiring a new auditor company to come in and to take care of that. But in the meantime, it is causing issues with us being able to get the grants that we need to do. Um, so we're hoping to have that finalized soon. Um, I think that was a big, the big thing they're gonna, they've got the laptop um, agreement where they're, they um, purchase one third every year. So they're looking at doing 17 new laptops this year. Um, they had an event for their 40th anniversary and they raised $2,089 at that event. So um, it, it was a good thing. Um, hopefully they'll be doing more of those. But that's Central Minnesota Jobs and Training. Um, AMC Board of Directors meeting was actually, um, they're gonna have that on November 1st. They wanted to wait until all of the district meetings had met. And so that did not happen. That will be happening on November 1st. Um, the Central Solid Waste Commission. We had a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> One is, <laughs> just because it's interesting to me, they're building this new cell and, and it's a construction project. And they're putting in this, they got the clay liner all in. And they, they have to do these 
they take a core sample of that clay. And apparently what has to happen is they take that core and send them off to a testing lab and they have to try to force water through that column. And that takes a long time. It's not a, you know, they just, and if it doesn't go, it doesn't go. It's, it's a matter of days or weeks that they have to put pressure on this to see if it's going to go through. Well, the problem is they got to, they can't put the plastic liner in until they get the test results back. Uh, we can understand that. It's just the, so they're waiting and waiting patiently for this, these test results. They have no reason to believe they're, they're using the clay from the same farm that they've used in every other cell. They've, the same engineering firm has been there, done the compaction test as they're doing it. So they don't think there's an issue, but until they get those test results, they can't proceed. In the meantime, they got this vault. It looks like an elevator shaft. And that is the place where all the leachate is gonna collect. And as they've been building this thing, some of the workers are going, you know, there's some cracks in this thing. Don't look right. So they're taking pictures and sending them. The engineers are looking at it and they're sending it back. Finally, last week, the manufacturer of that vault, I'll call it, says, that's not right. We, <laughs> we got to replace that thing. So now it's got all this compacted clay around. It's 35 feet down at the ground. They got get a crane in there, lift the old one out, put a new one in, get it sealed up, and it, it, that's going to be a mess. So that's a two-week process to get a new thing built and get it in there. It's built specific for that site. And already had a bunch of piping put into it, so uh, it, it's not a good deal. On the positive side, we received a grant from the Pollution Control Agency for a building at our Cambridge location because we have contracted with a nonprofit organization to pull stuff out of the garbage as private individuals come and back their pickup of to dump it in, They're, they this private um, nonprofit hires a guy to be there and say, "Oh, cats! That ping pong table looks brand new. We can resell that because I saw right, one right, of those yeah. there." And so they're pulling this stuff out. They pull out enough stuff every month to pay that guy's salary <laughs> that they sell, and so. For every pound of stuff they pull out of there, it's one less pound that has to go in the landfill. So I, I think it's a win, win, win. Now we're going to get a grant so we can have a building for them to work out of. I think it's a good deal. The other grant we're looking to, to hopefully get is these forever uh, chemicals. You've no doubt read about them, PFAS. 3M manufactured these company this chemical that you spray in your furniture, keep the stains off your furniture. We've used them on our tents and our whatever. They're everywhere, but they do not break down. And so we get this leachate. We have to come up with a plan to get rid of those PFOPs out of our leachate before we can land apply it or transport to pig's eye for treatment. And it's like, apparently the state doesn't have a clue how to get rid of it because they're giving us a grant, write a plan of how we're supposed to get rid of it. So I don't know, uh, <laughs> we'll do our best. So I think, I think Caleb had talked a long time ago about wanting to do the recycling of things that went to the processing plant. That's right. It's kind of cool that it's happening. Yep. Yep. It is cool. Um, East Central Regional Library. Um, I have one more month of being the president and my term is up. Um, so we're, we're in the middle of doing the negotiations for that or, or the um, nominating for that. Um, 
With the budget, one of the things that Kanavik did, because Kanavik County has always paid for two extra hours for their library to be open. They've just got the one library. And so for their budget, they pulled that back and they're not going to be paying for those two extra hours. So we needed to decide what the new hours were going to be. One of the things that are going to be coming up is Aiken County. Um, they received the highest increase for the library and what it costs them to have it. And it's because of their... Um, my brain just quit on me, um, their tax capacity rate. And their tax capacity rate went up because of utilities. It's not because of the people that are there, the residences or the taxes that, that we pay, but because of their utilities. So they're going to be asking to have our joint powers agreement relooked at next year to figure out if we can figure out a different way to do that. Um, I don't know if there's a different way to do it that's more fair than what we already have, um, but we will be seeing where that goes um, Madam Chair, yeah. potentially related to that, the state of Minnesota is undergoing a review process of how those state assessed properties are handled. And so the library board may want to make sure that if the state does something that whatever the, the library might make modifications to fits with any changes. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was pretty much library. Does anybody have any others? Yes, I had a Northeast uh, transportation meeting the other day. Mm -hmm. um, not a lot of new project talk, mostly uh, stuff that dealt with engineers. But it was a lot of engineer talk about how to fill out this or there's a new form for this mm. or whatever. So kind of over a commissioner's head. And then uh, we had the tour of our economic development block yes. in Pine City. Um, I think that's what we called it. But yeah. we, uh, I thought it was a great tour. We had uh, we toured the um, rec center, uh, nursery, school, uh, and student housing at the Old Lakeside Clinic. We toured the homeless shelter, a place for you and uh, two different apartment complexes that are in that same block. Um, and, and I think that whole, that whole development of, of all of that stuff uh, leads right back to our economic development director, Leslie. Uh, she's yeah. the one that did the work. We can take credit if we want, but really it was Leslie. the work that she did. Yeah. I think one of the things that amazed me is there were um, one of the one of the apartments has 24 dwellings, I believe, and one of them had 12 and they're they're full yeah. they, and they have a waiting list, you know, and that just shows how bad we need to have housing in our county. We're really suffering from that. And we keep talking about how we need to bring jobs in, but we're losing employees because we don't have housing and daycare. So to have that new daycare facility, which is amazing. And then the rec center at the, at the um, college, at the, at the housing unit area is phenomenal. They can go there and play video games and just do whatever. It's amazing. And their, their um, housing is pretty cool too. It's, nice yeah just and to think a lot of that property we toured not the rec center or that well that as well was on an, i mean it was condemned right yeah. it was the where that big apartment complexes was uh foreclosed. It was foreclosed and then they had to abate a bunch of yeah. uh, hazardous materials um and technically the rec center and all that nothing was going on there that was going to turn into the same all within what a half a block of each other a block yeah. and yeah that wouldn't be done it wouldn't have been done without some government um, stuff getting in there and getting this straightened out now there's a most of it's private owned um well actually it all is oh, okay. yeah and you turn down that there's a little more work that could be done around there when we we're walking but um but it's it's a nice area really nice area so and the city i think is working on trying to get that access for the lake open, I think so. which is right there, um, which would just be another benefit to that area. I don't know, but it wouldn't have happened without uh, without the. Actually, Leslie was part of that back when she worked at the city yeah. as well. I you think know? she's been a major player in all of it. And yeah, she's she is a go getter. She's a, 
the front of me. Anybody else have any others? I just have a question. Yes. Um, I missed the tour of the building. And how would you the, the kind of what, what about that? How'd that go? Yeah, that's what we're talking about. I missed that. Yeah. It, was, <laughs> it went well. It's, it's amazing. What they've done is absolutely amazing. That's students also. Uh, okay. Yeah. And so, that's what I didn't. Uh, so the one was, um, it's three different complexes, and each one has four houses in it. And then Paul Newman built uh, a 24 unit apartment oh. on the other side of that. So we got to, Kevin gave us a tour of the inside. Got it. I, so, yeah. I missed it. Sorry. Thanks. Yeah. Nope, you're fine. Well, and then the homeless shelter. Well, too. The homeless shelter. Amazing. Holy cow, they've done a lot of work on that. That's really nice. Yeah. Good job. Yeah, then the, the tie in with uh, uh, Leslie and, and like Josh had said with the, uh, you know, the blight and the abatement and the issues. You guys, you guys went up and met in Finlayson because there's like a building there. I uh, know they've been working on also. And is, is there any hope at all that that might be in the running <laughs> for the same kind of rehabilitation and, and help? I know I've been talking with their, their mayor and people up there, but it's also, uh, it's also in rough shape. I guess not to compare to what you guys started with on the Pine City end. It was a little better. You, it is in very rough shape. Um, <laughs> I, it has some challenges. I think the meeting was productive. Uh, the city seems willing to be a partner in the process. Um, Greg Beck, the forester, uh, land commissioner, has done some work trying to figure out how to start the abatement of some of the asbestos and there might be a well on the property. Uh, and so I know there's a little bit of movement uh, and I just haven't followed up recently. But I can do that. Well, great. Yeah, let me know, please. What building is that? It's the old creamery. Next oh, to yeah, the, yeah. Uh, yeah. I know where that is. Yeah, right yeah. next to the yep. uh, hardware store. Yep. Great location. Yep. Yeah, it is. Yep. One of them is we are starting a new grant for restorative justice in Pine County, which um, is going to be really awesome. So one of the things that they're talking about is we may be getting a new employee down the road if the grant is accepted. That will be able to take the youth out to, to help them restore what the bad choices that they made, right? And so it may be community service projects or some other things, but um, it's an amazing committee of um, like Donnie Zeman, the mayor from Pine or from Hinkley, is on there. Um, county employees, there's other um, just public servants from throughout the county. So it's it's going to be a, a good group of people. Um, I went to the SCRED meeting um, and I went to support Devin from probation because he was given an award for his Yeti project, um, which is incredible. Just the work that he does with the kids before they go into truancy court to see if he can help them so that they don't have to have the actual court experience, but to see if they can get stuff on track before then. So it's good to be able to be there to celebrate Devin. Um, we had a minute or um, AMC had another tribal leaders meeting with county commissioners and there were um, just a handful of counties that are invited to be part of that. And then it was almost all of the health. Um, so one of the things that we found out are some of the counties are holding services and I, I don't know they feel like some of the counties are holding services from them. So for instance, um, medical assistance that people who are blind or disabled aren't able to get the medical assistance that they need. Um, the question is, did they fill out the paperwork to get medical assistance when it needed to be redone? Because with COVID, everything was so different. And now it's getting back to you have to fill out your applications. So trying to figure out how that is and so we can best serve. Um, another one was um, SNAP. You know, one county was saying that they weren't going to give tribal members SNAP. And so doing just trying to figure out if that's the full story or part of the story, you know, because we all hear a part of the story. We need to make sure that it's all true. But in, while you're hearing all of that, it makes you really realize that we need to really be cautious about what we do to make sure all people are served the way that they should be. Um Yeah, that, that was the majority of that, just visiting with them and, and talking. Um, one of them said that they needed to have a mentorship program um, because they got people coming out of jail or whatever that need to. I don't know how we can help them with that because they're not going to want me to do. <laughs> that guy said that to the guy. Um, it was Bruce from Fond du Lac. And I said, you're not going to want me to be your mentor for your people because I'm not tribal. 
you know, so trying to figure out how we can help them to help themselves to get those people in, into place to do that. Um, November 1st, we are doing a presentation on family resource centers with the um, state and tribal committee that I'm on. And um, it's going to be good. We're going to have Sam and Kayla from Pine County are going to go down with me. And Kayla's the one that has set up our family resource centers. And Becky's got numbers that I, I'm really excited to see on how our out-home placement has been reduced since we put family resource centers into play. So it's, it's going to be, um, they're looking at putting them on reservations um, and just trying to work with them on what it will look like and how, how that will help. So we had a pre-meeting to plan with the other committees or the other counties that are going to be involved with that. And then we had a rural action caucus meeting, which is through NACO. And one of the things that I had gotten from um, Paul Raymond was he was on the Township Association and they met and they're saying they're trying to get a resolution passed or take it to the state where we need to have cell phone service in a lot of our rural areas because there is none. And I think we've all dealt with that when we've been traveling around our county. Um, the rural action caucus actually has a resolution that the National Counties Association is taking um, hopefully next year to Congress to get 5G cell service to everybody that's unserved. And then after we get everybody served, then they're going to start raising it up and we'll get um, the, everybody that has 4G now to get to 5G. One of the things that makes me leery about that is they put out the same thing that they did with broadband where it's the application process. And we all know how that worked. You had one company that did it all and they couldn't do any of it. Um, so hopefully this, they're going to put more planning into this one on who they're going to be able to take applications from and, and get that taken care of. But um, that's one of the big things that are being worked on with that is the, the um, cell service. And that's it. One more. Okay, one more. No, any more others? Okay, so we have the settlement offer. I would like, I would like to go into a closed session for that. Is there anybody that has a different opinion on that? So Josh, can we have a motion? I see yep. your head shaking. Or, uh, do you want a statute or something? Or do you want yeah, and I, the motion will be to close the meeting as provided by Minnesota Statute 13D.05, Subdivision 3B, attorney-client privilege to review proposed separation agreement to settle uh, an arbitration with AFSCME Council 65 in Pine County. So moved. Do you have a second? Okay, a motion by Josh, second by Steve. Are there any questions on this? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion so carried. We have a conference room out the door and to the right uh, if we want to move to that after, if you want to take a five minute break. Yep. Sounds good. Resettle.
would it, would it yeah, I would just <laughs> re reconvene the whole thing in the portion of the meeting. All right. Yeah. Yes. It's like lunchtime. Yeah, it smells <laughs> like lunchtime. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> All right, we're going to reconvene this meeting. And we have a motion to accept the separation, separation agreement. Thank you. Matt, were you going to make a motion? Yeah, I'm, on, I'm just trying to figure out how do we re refer it? Uh, you could, agreement. You know, if the motion were to approve the separation agreement and authorize the county administrator to sign. Yeah, okay, I will make that motion. Thanks, Matt. Okay. Thanks, Josh. So we have a motion by Matt, a second by Josh to settle this arbitration settlement. Um, are there any other questions on this? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. And since there's no 